Uh, beloved Nakan, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to, of course, acknowledge the Minister of Education, Mr. Arts, your, your president, all your officials of the association, uh, and all of you who are here. I, um, I'm in budget mode at the moment, um, thus the delay. But I thought what I could do uh, before addressing some of these issues is do a very quick and short presentation to you uh, regarding the budget itself and what are the sort of uh, determinants and factors that have impact on our ability to uh, develop, uh, deliver a budget. As you know that, um, um, hopefully you know this, that so not only, and unfortunately a lot of people think that budget, um, sorry this mic is probably not working. A lot of people think that budgets are only about the following year. It's not actually. The budget needs to be about addressing if there's any immediate issues, but it's also about setting the stage or building upon your strategy for the next 5, 10, 15 years time. It needs to be a building block approach. Unfortunately, uh, many people um, like to see budgets only as a yearly event. And that's the culture we've been trying to change uh, within the bureaucracy uh, that when we, uh, for example, if somebody asks for a building to be built, it's not only about the building itself, but why is it being built? And if you're going to build a building now, what will be the um, relevance of that building in, say, three years' time? Is it going to be big enough? Is it going to be still very small? Do you have ex ability to expand upon it? Those are the kind of considerations we need to have, you know, uh, need to have in play. Of course, currently, we've been through a pandemic. We also are facing, uh, facing you know, what we call um, uh, inflation as a result of many things outside our control. I think it's critically important for teachers to understand, whether you're a principal or a head teacher or even a, a, a teacher, to understand what's the dynamics at play within the economy, because it has a huge impact. Uh, not only you yourself, in terms of government's ability to, for example, offer you better salaries, uh, offer better capital projects for your respective schools, be able to offer various services to your clients who are your students, and indeed the prospects for your students. Uh, you are high school principals. Uh, most of your students very soon will actually go to university, will get a job. And it's really in your, uh, within your remit uh, to be able to know that what will happen to the future and what can we offer to them. Of course, access to technology has been highlighted earlier on, plays a pivotal role because now we've seen, you know, there's a change in um, the, the psychology of students, as you know, in the past number of years. Most of you are old enough to know that when you were in st when you were a student, there was no such thing as a mobile phone. And now everybody has mobile phones. There's over 600,000 authentic Facebook accounts in Fiji. About 650,000 actually. With the population about 890,000 people. With the population base where 65% of the population is below the age of 35. 70% below the age of 40. Both, most of you actually fall outside that category. So you are in the minority. All of us are in the minority. So you have to understand that set of dynamics. You have to understand the attention span of your students. What can they be engaged by? Your traditional teaching methodology is not necessarily going to appeal to them. They're used to seeing things, visual. A visual teaching appeals to them more, as opposed to some old dude standing in front and trying to teach. That's the thinking. So, Again, all of this has an impact, so our ability to have, you know, uh, connectivity. Earlier this year, I was in Vanuatu. There were 40 sites, predominantly schools, that did not have internet connectivity. The teachers from those schools, most of them were actually primary schools, the teachers actually had to ten, travel 10 kilometers to get access to internet connectivity to print the work. The teachers who are being posted there did not have mobile phone connectivity. So who would want to go to a rural place where you can't be on your Facebook every two hours? Right? These are the hardcore realities. We connected these people to internet. If there was a village there, if there was a farming community nearby, we Wi-Fi the school compound so the people in that community could come and get connectivity. It was extremely empowering for them. 
but it also showed the great disparity between what most of you actually get to experience and enjoy and those who don't have that. So, your president talked about inclusivity. That's part of being inclusive. A lot of people think inclusivity is about gender or ethnicity or religion. It's not only about that. It's about access to services. It's about reducing the gap between those who have and those who have not. It's about reducing the disparity in services between the rural and maritime and those in the urban centers. Fundamentally, that inclusivity is very critical. So with that as a, as a background, uh, if I could just very quickly take you through the budget itself and some of the things that are at play at the moment in respect of what has an impact on our ability to deliver the budget. COVID-19 actually reduced the size of our GDP by 17.2 percent. It's the largest contraction ever in the history of Fiji, in the history of many countries in the world. Nobody expected that in the 21st century that the different countries in the world or all countries in the world would actually shut down their borders. Nobody expected that. USA, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand only until recently. UK, India, Russia, everywhere else, China, all shut down their borders. As a result of which, obviously, a country that's been very heavily dependent on the tourism sector, 40% of our GDP comes from the tourism sector, over 100,000 Fijians lost their jobs. Now, it's not only about the people who work in hotels, or people who work at the airport, or people who work at Fiji Airways. It's about those people who actually live off those people who live off the tourism sector. The example I like to give is we go outside Nandi Airport, just outside the airport you'll see a very nice bus shelter has been built by Fiji Airways and behind that there's a bunch of trees, thick trees. Now over there you have mainly women who sell lovo packs, roti parcel, mitai, boiled evi. Their customers are the people who work at the airport, Fijians. Their customers are people who work at ATS, who work at Fiji Airways. Now when the planes are in flying, when the ATS is no longer catering, when the airport is not operational, they don't know, they no longer have any customers. So they are also affected and these people are in the informal sector. A lot of the students that you teach, their parents are the ones who work in those areas. The last survey done by RBF before the pandemic was there about 130,000 Fijians earn a living through the informal sector. They don't have FNPA. They simply live off that. Some of them make good money, some don't. The ladies who work, if you go to the Artriga Hotel, you go to the Hilton Hotel, you go to the Fijian, you have all these women from the nearby villages who actually sit in some corner and they're making handicraft. They're not employed by the hotels, but they're given a space to actually make their goods and sell their goods to the tourists. They are no longer employed. People who, you know, come and perform from the villages and do the meke to the tourists, no longer have a job. The artists who perform in bands no longer have a job. The DJ no longer has a job at the hotels. We lost as a result of that $4.6 billion of our GDP. You can see the GDP actually contracted from $11.8 billion to about $9.7 billion. We lost $4 billion in foreign exchange. All of you are wearing clothes. Some of your clothes are maybe sewn in Fiji, but none of the fabric is from Fiji. Fabric comes from overseas. People are wearing lipsticks. People are wearing shoes. People are wearing, I'm holding this mic. The carpet I'm walking on, everything comes from overseas. The cars you all came in over here, everything comes from overseas. Put simply, in order to buy things from overseas, you need foreign exchange. They don't buy it in Fijian dollars, you have to buy it in US dollars. Japanese yen, euros, Aussie dollars. So, it's a two problem issue. Is that we lost that much in foreign reserves because the tourists stopped coming. Fiji Airways stopped selling tickets in LA, San Francisco, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong. No foreign exchange is coming through. And secondly, of course, because of the fact that there is less spin. Those tourists aren't coming, they're not buying your handicraft, they're not paying STT, they're not paying ECAL, they're no longer paying VAT. Government revenue went down by 50% overnight. We get our money from that. 
You, get, you used to get lots of money from that. The government revenue by, went by 50%. So we took some, obviously, measures. So we stopped rural and maritime allowance. Right? That's the result of that. But we did not reduce the salaries, even though you did not teach for a period of time. We did not reduce the salaries. But we stopped rural maritime allowance. Our family care leave was reduced and then removed completely. Uh, paternity leave was taken away. Those are some of the measures we did because we didn't want to reduce salary. But we had to do that. Government pumped in $500 million in income support, and I'll tell you why, how we did that. Additional on top of paying wages and salaries. Can anybody take a guess what's our wages bill for civil servants throughout in one year? Your school will get a computer if you win this. What's the civil salary? Yes? Close to 300 million? No. Somebody from the back? 100 million? No. 1.1 billion. 1.1 billion dollars is our wages bill for civil servants. Our total expenditure for a financial year is about 3.3 billion, thereabouts. So one third of what we pay is in wages. Includes your wages, doctors, police, etc., everybody. Then, of course, we pay for the operational expenditure. We pay for your fake, the vehicle that I came in, we pay for the fuel, the toilet paper, the copying, photocopying paper, the printers, etc. That's your operational expenditure. And then the other third, of course, not the other third, but the other part of it is your capital expenditure. We build stuff. The economy has been growing for nine years straight. We've never had this in Fijian history. We had once seven years of consecutive growth after independence. So when you have growth, continuous growth, uh, your economy will grow in terms of more jobs will be created. So therefore, in this period, we had a unemployment rate was the lowest in 20 years. You know, there's more jobs were available. You see more cars on the roads in Fiji now than ever before. Two-pronged, because a lot more people had jobs, a lot more money in their pockets, and obviously at the same time, people had more money, the duty had come down, so you know, it became affordable. And of course, you can see the contraction here, 17.2% contraction, significant. All of you, I assume, have all been vaccinated, that's why you still got your jobs. We had a no jab, no job policy. We also said that if you wanted to get the 360, you had to be vaccinated. I'd love to show you a graph, which I don't have, when the rate of vaccination in Fiji is fairly flat. The moment we said you had to get a jab, you have a job, and then more so when you said, when you, said you had to get the 360, you had to be vaccinated, it suddenly the, it spiked up. <laughs> People get incentivized by money, in particular for the 360. As a result of that, of course, I mean, sorry, before that I should say, none of you have paid a single cent for being vaccinated. We as a government have not paid a single cent for the vaccines. So the moment the word vaccine was mentioned, we immediately got on to our development partners. The Prime Minister started talking to all the development partners, uh, the countries on a bilateral basis, Australia, New Zealand, India, uh, USA, etc. We started talking to the World Bank, IMF, ADB, because we knew that the moment the vaccine was developed, it was the bigger boys and girls who would get the first bite of the cherry. USA's population is about 300 million people. If you need two doses, that means the order with the pharmaceutical company would be for 600 million doses. 600 million doses, comes little Fiji, not even 900,000 people. Assuming you need 900,000 doses, twice 1.8 million order. He's a pharmaceutical company, Who's gonna, who is he going to give it to? The 600 million doses, bigger order. And that's why we kept on saying there needs to be what we call vaccine justice vaccine accessibility, and this precisely what happened is that many of the smaller countries, because they did not push hard, they got their vaccines later on. That's why a lot of them actually did not open up till much later on. Last year, around about March or so, we had something like 5,000 cases. By 1st of December last year, we opened up our borders. We were the most quickest and highly vaccinated country in the developing world. 
Now, the Indians initially gave us 100,000 doses for free. Then the Australians, Kiwis, then the Americans, and now, of course, the French are giving us doses too. That is a direct result of us opening our borders. They expect the economy to grow by 12.4%. Obviously, we're starting with a lower base. That's why it's going up to 124 and it continued to grow for the next, at least for the next three years. These are the projections. Normally, projections are done for three years. Now, before the pandemic, we had 894,000 tourists that came to Fiji. If the pandemic, pandemic had not happened, we probably would have had 1 million tourists at least or more than that by now. Last year, we had only 32,000 tourists. We expect about 492,000 tourists. Where are they coming from? mainly Australia. In the month of May, if you compare the month of May this year to the month of May 2019 when it did not have a pandemic, we've got 90% of those numbers of May 2019, fairly close to 100%. New Zealand, of course, recently only opened up their borders in the sense they, could, they said to the citizens before, if you travel overseas, when you came back, you had to go into quarantine. Now there's no longer a requirement for quarantine. New Zealand is about two-thirds. The rest of them come from USA, predominantly. June, July bookings look well. I don't necessarily go through, have to go through this, but you can see where the growths are. Now, there's enormous inflationary measures, uh, pressures. Even before the Russia-Ukraine war, the price of things had gone up tremendously. There are two reasons. One of them is fundamentally what you call supply chain issues. Every one of you has one of these. You have a microchip that's used, that needs needed to operate these phones or your computers. Now, the microchip is actually made out, of course, it's electronics, but the actual tray for the, micro, the microchip is made out of a particular metal, which is mined, it's like mining gold or silver or tin. It's mined. So when you have lockdowns, when you have bubbles, mining stops. Short supply of that particular mineral, short supply of that particular metal, but people still have a high demand. Yangona before Cyclone Winston was $85 a kilo in Suva. After Cyclone Winston, $185 a kilo. People still drank it at the same rate. Right? <laughs> the price went up. A bunch of bananas in Suva before Cyclone Winston is about three bucks. After Winston was $7, all the banana trees fell down. Supply demand issue. The other issue that actually affected the price was the availability of containers. China is the largest manufacturer in the world. Whether one likes it or not, it is the largest manufacturer in the world. China, until only recently, was in lockdown. So the containers were not available. The cost of a container before the pandemic from New Zealand to Fiji was $5,500. After the pandemic, it was $16,500. So if I'm an importer, I will pass that price on to you. After the Russia-Ukraine war, of course, many people did not know this, but Ukraine feeds 400 million people in the world. Between Russia and Ukraine, they have 30% of all the production of all the cereals in the world. Cereals include wheat also. Russia is the third largest exporter of fuel, oil. So that obviously again put enormous pressure. You can see over here in this graph, the red line here is what you call the imported inflation. Stuff that's completely out of our control. Domestic inflation is a green line. Sits at about 3.4, imported inflation about 10%. You can see over here the domestic inflation high is you know, fairly low here, even below zero. Over here, you can see imported inflation was below zero also. Price of fuel at one stage is about 24 US dollars a barrel only 18 months ago. Today, it's about 120 dollars a barrel. This morning, though, however, they said the uh, barrel of oil now has come down by $10 because there's a fear of a global recession. And if there's going to be a global recession, there'll be less demand for fuels, and therefore, based on that fear, the price has come down. You can see, in a way, how whimsical it is. Completely out of our control. But the price of fuel, obviously, can have an impact on your domestic inflation. So I'm growing, you know, eggplants in Singatoga Valley. The middleman comes and buys my eggplants by sackful. That's what they do. They can buy, you know, 25 sacks of eggplant, bring it to Suva. Now, if the price of fuel has gone up, the middleman now will push up the price of the sack of eggplant. By the time it reaches Suva, that will get passed on to the consumer. 
That's why fuel has a, what we call an all-encompassing impact. All of Banua Levu, the, fuel, the electricity is generated by diesel. Ovalau at the moment, diesel. Tabuni, some of it is diesel. So obviously there's a huge impact in terms of the cost of running and so, of supplying that electricity. I want to show you a video uh, which will demonstrate to you the impact of what's happened uh, via uh, Ukraine. Shillings, it's really tough for us. Ukraine grows enough food to feed four hundred million people on planet Earth. So when the farmers on the battlefields aren't planting or aren't harvesting, what impact do you think that's going to have? You've got a catastrophe knocking and looming on the door for the fall uh, that will be not a price issue but a supply issue availability of food for people around the world and that will be a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe keke, bread, scone, cake, all of it is made from flour. Flour is made from wheat. We don't grow wheat. Only two companies in Fiji make flour. Punja and Sons in Nabutu in Latoka, FMF in Walu Bay in Suva. They buy the wheat from Australia. They bring the wheat, they grind it here, they put some vitamins, you get flour. You don't buy your flour from Punja and Sons in Nabutu or Walu Bay in FMF. You buy it from the supermarket. So, before they sell their flour to the supermarkets, they have to have what they call, they have a price control. It's what you call wholesale price control. So before they sell it to say shop and save, they'll go to the Fijian Competition Consumer Commission and they'll say, I bought the wheat, for example, at $300 a ton. This is my labor cost, this is my electricity cost, my distribution cost. And FCCC will say, okay, you can make only this much margin. Then they sell it at that price to say shop and save in Suva. Then before Shop and Save sells it to you as a consumer, they'll they go off to FCCC and say, look, I bought it at this much from Punja and Sons. I'm renting a building in Suva. I pay this much rent, my labor cost, storage cost, etc., shelf cost. And they say, okay, make only this much margin. That's what you call a retail price control. So that's how you have price control. But if tomorrow Australia is going to sell uh, them the wheat, not from th at $300, but at $400, obviously the price will be ruled over. That's how the cost get passed. The cost get passed on. For many people in North Africa, in the Middle East, their basic source of carbohydrate is bread. Not bread as we like, as we know, like long loaf, but you know the pita breads, the flat breads. We in Fiji have dal and cassava. We have kumala. We have uto. These are locally grown food, foods. We have that substitute for carbohydrate. So, if you think that the price of bread is too much, you can actually eat uto. 
you want to. It's a reality. We don't know how long this war is going to go for. It could spread. We don't know whether it's going to spread or not. A couple of weeks ago, one of the Russian generals was threatening to invade another neighboring country. It did not give it access to Kaliningrad, which is an exclave of uh, Russia. Those things could happen. It could have an impact. Russia has a direct gas pipeline to Germany. They supply them with gas, cooking gas. That's now stopped. Americans are telling the rest of the world, don't trade with Russia. We have to punish them for invading Ukraine. Europe is also saying the same thing. The Qataris are still extracting gas, but there is less supply of it now because the Russians are no longer supplying gas. So the Europeans will not want that gas also. In normal times, I don't know how many of you know this, but in normal times when there is a winter in Europe, the price of fuel always goes up. People need more fuel to keep themselves warm. In particular, if it's a very cold northern winter, that always affects the price. So that's what's happening. Now, in all of this, countries that did not manage their finances well have run into trouble. So one of the most common issues is about is, of course, foreign exchange, like, like I mentioned earlier on. So countries that did not manage the foreign exchange in anticipation of the pandemic or as the effect of the pandemic, they no longer have actually foreign currency to be able to buy things, imported items. And some countries have had the dollar devalued. If you're importing a lot of things, the dollar is devalued, those cost of those imported items will cost you even more. I'll show you the next video, which is from Sri Lanka. And that shows to you as to what's happening there as a, as a result of them not being able to manage the economy, in particular the foreign uh, reserves well. Helping put food on the table, community kitchens like this are starting up around Sri Lanka as people struggle with its worst economic crisis in more than 70 years. Food inflation has hit nearly 60%. And many people are finding it difficult to cope. Most of these community who are coming today or been coming are surviving with two meals. So we are giving them the responsibility of surviving for one meal and we are saying, right, we will support you with one meal, but a good healthy meal. Few now get to eat this well. It's very difficult. We rarely get food like this. Only my husband is working, but what he earns for a day is not enough to feed the three of us now. Tax cuts three years ago slashed government revenue by more than $2 billion. The tourism industry was then damaged by the Easter bombings and the pandemic. Now there is no money to import fuel, medicine, cooking gas or food. Right now actually our main focuses are on food banks, on community kitchens and again long to medium term uh, community gardens and home gardens because we can give rations but it's very short term. The government is appealing for help. We urgently require the assistance of our friends in the international community to ensure that our immediate needs in terms of the importation of essential medicines, food supply and poor farming. India and China have sent food and medicine in recent days. The opposition says the government has weakened the economy through populist policies and mismanagement. A nationwide campaign dubbed Gota Go Home has been running for two months, calling on the president to resign. The government is seeking a loan package from the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. Critics say it will take too long, even if agreed, and people need action now. Tens of thousands of Sri Lankans are going hungry amid the country's worst economic crisis in decades. Community kitchens like this can only feed a fraction of them. Mina Fernandez, Al Jazeera, Colombo. If you look at inflation um, throughout the world, USA sits at about 8.5% at the moment. UK is a whopping 9.1%, New Zealand 6.9%, Australia is 5.1%, we about 5%. Your area shot up to 88 .8. In fact, last week it was about 7%. Uh, Japan sits at 25 it was about 1.5% last week. If you look at the World uh, Food Price Index, which is carried out by FAO, you can see all of them are trending upwards. 
The only one that's not trending upwards is sugar, unfortunately, because you would have got better, higher price for sugar. But it's not. Uh, most of it is obviously you know, going through the roof. What did we do in the revised budget? We zero rated a VAT on all these items, 21 items. If we had not zero rated VAT, you'd be paying 9% more. The citizens of this country would be paying 9% more for all of these items. What is really interesting for all of these, these are what one may call things that you need to live, run your household, be safe, be clean. Sugar in Fiji, comes from Fiji. Flour, imported, right, wheat. Rice, most of the rice you eat is imported. A lot of the canned fish you eat is imported. Cooking oil, 100% imported. Potatoes, 100% imported. Onions, imported. Garlic imported, baby milk Im imported, all of this 100%. Powdered milk, all imported. They just brand it differently. Liquid milk, most of it is imported. Dal, all imported. Tea, all imported. Salt, all imported. Most soap is imported. Soap powder is imported. Toilet paper, some is made here, a lot of it is imported. Sanitary pads, all imported for females. Toothpaste, imported. Kerosene, imported. Cooking gas is imported. So you can see how important it is for us to make sure that we have enough foreign reserves. In Sri Lanka, they don't have enough foreign reserves to even buy fuel. They don't have enough foreign reserves to buy medicine because they do not manage their foreign reserves well. And some stupid academics are currently comparing us to Sri Lanka. That's the level of intellectual input we're getting uh, by some academics in Fiji and outside. So, where are we? Exchange rate stability. A lot of people don't realize that if this was not managed properly, the Fijian dollar would have been devalued. That would have been, as the director of FAO would have said, a catastrophe, catastrophe upon catastrophe. This would have happened. $500 million in what we call livelihood support. What was that about? Let me just quickly take you through that. Six hundred, six, sorry, 68,864 Fijians got paid $205 million to government directly. These were people who were what we call in the formal sector, you know, people who worked and where they got employees paid F and PF. And we said that you could access your general account, a certain amount of money on a fortnightly basis. Of course, a lot of them ran out of money in the general account. Remember in your F and PF account, when you pay your F and PF, it gets split into two. 70% goes into what you call a preserved account, 30% is your general account. Preserved account you can't touch unless you retire or if you're building a home or buying a home. General account is what you can touch for your know, medical expenses and various other things. So we said you could touch the general account. This many people we paid $205 million to. Then we had the first round of $90. As I mentioned, we wanted to also assist people who had, were in the informal sector. $90. We said this is per household. Then we very quickly found out people chortling from the system. Same people, five people from the same household were applying for $90. So that's why we reduced it to $50 per person. 10.6 million paid there. 11.2, 224,000 people got $50. Second round, 10.2, 205,000 people got uh, $50. Then now the famous 360. 106 million dollars paid to 294,000 people, 87 million to 241,000. From one to three was exclusive to Viti Levu. One to three. 360 was some people from Banu Levu who were formally engaged and who no longer had job, but most of the people who got it were from Viti Levu. Banu Levu got a hundred dollar system. We paid about two million dollars now. So 432 million dollars was paid out. That meant the economy, which is already very slow, got injected with $432 million. Of course, one or two people drank the, uh, drank the entire 360 in beer. <laughs> Most of them didn't. They bought food, they paid rent, they bought shoes, they bought clothes. But when they did do the spend that money, it created economic activity. So they would have hired a carrier, would have hired a taxi. So the carrier driver gets a business, the taxi driver gets a business. The people in the shop get more business, so they may hire one or two people as casuals. 
We could have paid all of that $106 million in the first round on one day. But we didn't because we knew everybody going to queue up outside Vodafone Digicel. will defeat the purpose. You remember we still had COVID. So we spread it over one, one week. The interesting thing in all of this, I hope you realize that, that all of that money, apart from the $205 million for the FNPF, nobody went and queued up outside the DO's office or the Ministry of Poverty Alleviation or some Turangani Koro advisory councillor. They all applied on the phone. They all got paid on the phone. So you had 70-year-olds, 60-year-olds doing the application on the phone. How many teachers can do that? How many people are adoptable to the digital space? Everybody had to have a TIN number, text identification number. So in that way, we're able to get more people into what we call mainstream financial system. But it goes to show that the economy is actually, I mean, the, the population has been exposed to quite a lot uh, from that perspective, uh, digital space concern. Now, we've done obviously a lot of things, you know, you no longer have ECAL, which is Environment Climate Adaptation Levy, deposit taxes to be $200, now $100, no more STEM duties, you want to start a business on the side, you don't have to pay a business license, unless of course you're selling food, and uh, you know, health inspectors have to come in. No longer require that. $200 million working capital, you get a loan, the first two years of interest we pay on your behalf to the financier, don't do any principal payments and interest payments until the third year. All the market vendors today in Fiji have had their market fees paid for this one whole year, up to the 31st of July of this year. If you're a fisherman, you're applying for a license, we pay the market fees for you. If you're a taxi driver, your license, your taxi license expired, you go apply for renewal, we pay for that. So, you know, everyday expenses, we try to meet that. And as a result of that, $500 million assistance was given. A lot of people in Fiji have become experts on debt. Of course, it's an election year. A lot of politicians try to make political mileage out of it. Every single country in the world borrows money. The salary that you get paid, the, the fees that we pay to the schools is not enough, uh, enough to cover everything. So we have to fund the salaries. When we build a school, when we, build a re uh, we do rehabilitation works, we don't make a profit. That's the job of government. When you put street lights, you now you can see rural electrification, rural street lights. Before, if there was a village and they wanted electrification, everybody had to pay 10%. If half of the village didn't pay the 10%, the electrification program never took off the ground. Living in a farming area, everybody living there had to pay 10%. That's gone. We have to do the 100% funding now. Now, just very quickly so you understand this. When people borrow money, you have to ask two fundamental questions. Why is the money being borrowed? What is, what's the purpose of borrowing that money? If we decide to borrow money, to build a nice big accommodation convention center in Pacific Harbor for any government minister who wants to take a rest when driving back to Suva, and we spend 25 million bucks, the stupid use of money. But if you're going to borrow money to give people electricity, if you're going to borrow money to connect people to roads, if you're borrowing money during a pandemic to make sure people don't go hungry and give them some kind of stipend, that's good use of money, good use of debt. I was on the eastern part of Banua Levu in the Tikina of Tawake last week. I was flabbergasted. There's about seven villages all along the coast and they don't have access to road. No road. Actually, eight villages. No road whatsoever. And I thought to myself, what the hell were people doing previously? They don't even have a basic road access. By the time they catch the fish up near Undu Point and want to bring it to the market, they probably have to spend about 500 bucks to add to the cost of their fish. The fuel cost of those punts are so high now. Then if you catch a carrier, you walk 10 kilometers, then you get a bus, then you get to Lambasa. They don't even have connectivity. So if you're going to borrow money to connect those people, if you're going to give electricity to a person who catches fish, and they know that when they sell the fish by the roadside, 
If they don't have electricity, they have to sell the bundle of fish. In the morning, they may start selling 30 bucks. By the afternoon, they'll bring it down to $5 because they know if they don't sell the fish, the fish will go bad. Unless, of course, they eat it themselves. The moment you connect them to electricity, they can keep their fish overnight in the cooler or the fridge. The next morning, they sell the same fish for 30 bucks. Sell fre put fresh water on it, you drive past, the fresh fish for sale, you buy it for 30 bucks. That's good use of debt. The other thing is, what's the cost of debt? How much are you actually paying to get access to that money? Which fundamentally means, in simple terms, interest rate. So if this lady here decides to borrow $100,000 for a business, she goes to BSP and BSP says, no problem. I'll give you $100,000, three years to pay, 15% interest rate. She also wants to borrow $100,000. She goes to home finance. So no problem, we'll give you $100,000. 30 years to pay, 1% interest rate. If I look at both of them, so both of them have got $100,000 debt. They're both in the same situation. Well, actually, they're not. She's going to have high blood pressure. She has to pay off her debt in three years' time. 15% interest rate. Monthly repayments will be so high. Her cash flow has to be right. If her cash flow is not right, she cannot do the repayment. She'll be in default of the loan. They might seize the business. She's in relax mode. 1% interest rate. If, if the business is down one month, it's okay. She, can, she only needs to pay 1% interest rate. That's in the same way we have in the past two years borrowed from the Japanese at 0.01%. 40-year term, 10-year grace period. By the time you pay a loan over 40 years, you have what we call a 60% grant element, which means you only pay back 40% of what you borrowed. We are borrowing from the World Bank because we've been knocking on the doors for the past six years to say you need to give us concessional financing because we are vulnerable to climate change. We've had 14 cyclones since 2016. Two years ago, when we had the cyclone, I think it was during Yasa time, the amount of rainfall we had in 24 hours was the same amount of rainfall that London gets in one year. And London is a bloody rainy place. We got the same amount of rainfall in 24 hours. So, we knocked on the doors. World Bank is now giving us what we call access to IDA funds. We borrowed 0% interest rate, a service fee of 0.75%, which means we have a grant element of 55%. Sorry, 45%. No, the other way around. 55% grant element, 45% we have to pay back. So, there are the two things you need to understand when people come and talk to you about debt. A lot of gurus are on about debt now. Salewun and Dinau. Both Bari Karza. They don't understand what they're talking about. There are two ways of measuring debt. One is debt to GDP ratio. Look at what your GDP is and you look at your, your debt and there's a percentage. At New Zealand, which is a very low debt country, before the pandemic, the debt to GDP ratio is 28%. After the pandemic, it almost doubled. 52%. Australia, 42 or up to 62%. Other tourism-based countries like St. Lucia in the Caribbean, Seychelles, Mauritius, Bahamas, Maldives. These people get over a million tourists. Most of the tourists come from Russia and Ukraine and Europe and China. 72% debt to GDP ratio before, sorry, before the pandemic. And now they're sitting at 137%. We were 46, 80%. A lot of people don't realize after Cyclone Winston, we spent $225 million just in rebuilding schools. Winston wiped off one third of the value of our GDP in 36 hours. That's why we don't like climate change. This year, we had only one cyclone, Cody. But those of you who travel along Queens Road would know that between Singatoka and Nandi in Kambisi, there was a big hole. Highway went. The one lane in Semo went. One lane in Nawai went. Completely out of our control. When we do a budget, we can't plan that there'll be a big hole in Kambisi and how much it'll cost. 
landslides in Bar and various other places. Irish crossings get washed away. They are what we call unanticipated expenditure. So what happens, for example? So if, for example, ACS is going to get a new building because they want some new space, and then they, it may cost, you know, $300,000, $400,000. If there's a cyclone and a road gets washed away somewhere and those people don't have access to the highway or can't get to town or city, we'll divert the funds from ACS and give it to fixing up that road. That's what we do. We do reallocation. So projects that may not be of high priority or is not critical will divert funds from there to meet critical expenditure. That's what happens. So people sometimes you say, oh, my project has not been done. Yes, because the money has gone somewhere else because that was more critical. Of course, there's no cyclone. That's great. Those projects will go ahead. Now, this is what we call debt to GDP ratio. As I mentioned to you before, our GDP has been growing. Some people made fun. They said, oh, the Beni Marama boom. It was actually a boom. And I'll tell you why. You see your nominal value of a debt, in other words, the dollar value of a debt, in 2009 was $3.1 billion. Debt to GDP ratio is 55.8%. In 2015, your debt was $4.2 billion, but your debt to GDP ratio came down to 43%. Why? Because your GDP has grown. Your pie has grown. Same way this lady is going to she has $100 and she goes and borrows $20, you would say a debt to GDP ratio is 20%. He goes and borrows $50, two and a half times more than what she's borrowed. But he has $500, his debt to GDP ratio would be only 10%. Because his pie has grown. So the philosophy behind this is that before the idea was there is an assumption that the pie was always this size. And if I have to give to him, I have to take it from him and give it to him. But if you grow the pie, everybody gets a bigger and equal share of the pie. This is the dollar value of debt. Internationally, when you measure debt, you measure it in US dollars. Nominal debt, debt value, US dollars. Again, these are all tourism-based countries. Bahamas is a lot smaller country than us. It's got debt of 11.4 billion US dollars, which is about 22, 23 billion Fijian dollars. Mauritius, 11.2 billion. Barbados, much smaller country than ours. Mauritius is about 1.1 million people. Barbados, 6.6 .6 billion US. Maldives, 6.3 billion. Fiji is about 3.7 billion US dollars, which is about, you can say, 8, 8 billion um, Fijian dollars. 3.7 billion US. And they have all these other countries. This is what you call the dollar value of the debt. Let's look at some of the other bigger countries. Now, these boys and girls are in trillion dollars. They're not billion, they're trillion. That's the next step up. U.S. is the most debt-ridden country in the world. 30.5 trillion U.S. dollars, which is about 60 trillion Fijian dollars. Japan, which is about 13 trillion. China is 12.8 trillion. U.K., 3 trillion. India, 2.8. Australia is about 976.7 billion dollars, nearly 1 trillion. It's all U.S. dollars. And, of course, Fiji is sitting here at 3.7 billion. Uh, New Zealand is 121.6 billion. The interesting thing is that nobody says that these people are debt-ridden. Nobody says, oh my God, New Zealand is so debt-ridden. Even though the dollar value of New Zealand's debt is 121.6 billion uh, U.S. dollars. Let's just put it into perspective. You should be able to get these slides on our web page. I will put that up so you can talk about it. Now, as I mentioned to you about foreign reserves, I'll try and sort of fasten up the pace because I'd like to open the floor for any questions or comments you may have. Now, you need, the International Monetary Fund says that you should have at least three months' worth of foreign reserves to trade. That's a healthy sign. You, you're okay. You know, it's like your sugar. You should be about 4%, 4.5 sugar. If you go in here like six, then you're running into trouble, six or seven, depending on your age. So we have at the moment 3.4 billion foreign dollars in reserves, which is about 7.9 months worth of trading in a healthy space. What is interesting is this. If you look at the, over here, we have two billion dollars, but 4.5 months of, of trading. 
you had only 1.3 billion, but 4.7 months. Why is that? Because when your economic activity is going on a lot, a lot of people are constructing their building, you'll have a higher demand for imported items. When people are buying more cars, you have a higher demand for imported items. So you need to have that level of foreign exchange. Liquidity is also something else uh, that's very important. Liquidity basically means the amount of money available in the banks. Remember, banks don't make money from having money in their bank. Banks make money by lending money. They make money from money. They don't like to have lots of money in their account, unlike other businesses. They make money from interest. So, I mentioned to you that all governments borrow. We've had a policy that whenever we borrow, we should borrow at least 70% from local lenders. FNPF, insurance companies, banks, they like to lend money because they make money on the interest. They buy our bonds, T-bills, treasury bills, short-term treasury bills also. That's an investment for them. FNPF also does not like to keep money because money, keeping money on your behalf does not make money for you. They need to invest. So it makes money, so then you get a higher pension. It's what you call the interest rates that you earn on your pension. A lot of people nowadays commenting, you know, politicians about FNPF. That's how they make money. FNPF owns the GPH. They own the Holiday Inn. They own the Intercontinental Hotel. They recently bought the Sheraton. They own all those properties. They make money from it. If they just simply kept your money in their account, money, as you know, depreciates over a period of time. So you're old enough to know for five, cents, for five cents before you could buy a lot of Chinese lollies. Today, you can't even buy one Chinese lolly for five cents. The house that you built 10 years ago would have cost far less than building a house now. A two-lane highway or four-lane highway outside Nandi Airport is better to build now than to build in 20 years' time. It costs less, but your productive capacity increases. So when the pandemic struck, we knew that one day the borders would open. We need to have enough liquidity because when... When the economy is shut down and when it opens up, people need access to funds to start their business. They need access to funds to build a warehouse or factory or shop, whatever. So the money that they're going to borrow needs to be cheap. So this is why this time around, when we borrowed money, we borrowed more from offshore. We did not borrow money from onshore. Uh, onshore. More from offshore means new money came in. When new money comes in, your foreign reserves goes up. And the amount of money in the system increases. You see over here, in 2010, we had only $348.4 million in liquidity. Interest rate was 7.4%. The lower the liquidity, the higher the interest rate. If you today go and put, you want to go and put term deposit, you won't get much interest rate. Banks already have a lot of money. So if they give you 1% for your term deposit, they'll lend your money to somebody for 7 8%. But when they already have their own money, why would they pay you? They'll even pay you less. The liquidity at the moment is quite high. Interest rates have come down. We believe the banks can further reduce these interest rates. But some big businesses are borrowing money at 4%. Some of them I know are borrowing at 3.8%. They're able to negotiate better and harder. So where to from here? Of course, I've, I've talked about all this. Two things that are what we call the downward risks. One is the Russia-Ukraine war. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how long it's going to go on for. We don't know whether it's going to spread. There's now talk about Russia and China uh, setting up their own little currency. They want to trade in gold. Gold is a means of uh, you know, uh, exchange, not US dollars. That could change the whole equilibrium. Uh, we don't know how successful that will be. And of course, like I mentioned, climate change. That's something completely out of our control. Government's job, of course, if you want to have you know, a lot of investment in technology, uh, business processes are changing, private sector-led growth. We've uh, made the taxation system a lot simpler. It's interesting when we import, uh, we had the highest amount of uh, agricultural produce exported last year. Kava, 
ginger and turmeric, haldi. Things like haldi and ginger are now seen to be a superfood. Many people for centuries have known haldi is good for you. They put powdered milk in milk and they drink it. Apparently it makes your arteries a lot more flexible so blood clots don't happen. Ladies put it on their skin before they get married. <laughs> Gives flexibility to your skin, makes you shine. But they've discovered haldi now. In the same way we have moringa which is sajan. It's now a superfood. So unfortunately in Fiji we have kind of been beholden to traditional forms of agriculture. Nobody talked about haldi, nobody talked about you know, moringa and all of this. If you went to any old cane farm, you'll find, you'll always find a moringa tree, a sajan tree there. Always. You'll find the Fijian tea there. Always. You'll find a lemon tea there, a lemon a tree. Those basic things were there, coconut tree, etc. So, that's a lot of that is happening. A lot of haldi in Navosa, a lot of the villages are going out in the hills. There's all organic, wild-grown ginger, uh, wild-grown haldi. They're digging it up and they're selling it. For us, we have to make sure that the pricing is right, that they don't get ripped off. The same way we open up the beach diva sales, we have to make sure the right people are buying it and giving those villages the right price for that too. There's a very important issue here that I want to talk to you about, and that is the lack of skill sets available in Fiji, and more so the poaching of that. We know some teachers have left Fiji, there's a shortage of teachers in certain areas. Math, science, physics in Australia. My brother-in-law teaches in a remote country town outside Griffith. He gets paid phenomenal allowances. He's a town of like 100 people. There's about 40, 50 kids, but they have that education system there. They paid enormous levels of allowances. You would have seen some advertisements in the papers over here. Australian recruiting agencies are wanting to recruit chefs from Fiji. Three, more than three years' experience, they're offering 80 to 120,000 Australian dollars. I recently went to Australia to uh, visit a, a family member who's now in what we call old people's home or aged care services. Every single person who was working there looking after these people who needed assistance was a foreigner. They're from Thailand, Afghanistan, uh, Indonesia, Philippines some European country, Ukraine or Romania or somewhere, every single person was a foreigner. So there's also been a poach, poaching of accountants, there's a shortage of accountants in Australia, there's a shortage of fruit pickers in Australia, there's a shortage of people in the hospitality sector. New Zealand is saying they have a shortage of about 60,000 people. Some restaurants aren't even opening full time, some hotels aren't opening full time because nobody wants to work in that sector. Some people got scared because of COVID. So guess what's going to happen? They'll come poaching for our people. I was talking to the doctor who's in charge of one of the medical centers in Suva, without naming it, six nurses left two weeks ago for overseas. India is recruiting nurses, sorry, UK is recruiting nurses from India. We have some of our nurses working in the Emirate countries. We have a lot of Fijian women in particular who work in California in San Francisco Bay Area, providing aged care services. Some legally, a lot of them illegally. <laughs> but there's a demand for it. There's a demand for it. They get paid 150 US dollars a day. Food, accommodation provided. So there's a, there's a whole shift in what's have, you know, what we call in the developed world in terms of work preferences. In Fiji today, 53% of all the cane farmers are, sorry, the average age of a cane farmer today in Fiji is 59 years. Before, if you had a cane farm, your great-grandfather did cane farming and everybody else did cane farming. And younger people don't want to do cane farming. Today, we use prisoners to cut cane. Nobody wants to cut cane. Even though we've got now dozens and dozens of cane harvesters. A lot of the cane harvesters cannot go on the side of the hill. Nobody wants to cut cane. So we pay the prisoners to go and cut cane. They get an account. So job preferences are, tr are changing. So as an educational system, what are your ideas, firstly in terms of training people? Before the pandemic, I was talking to a Fijian who works in the Silicon Valley, whose job was to actually find countries where 
people could do outsourcing. He's talking about coding, and we're talking about, you know, FNU, if they can do coding. Coding is the way to go. So, are we at the primary level, at the secondary level, providing that environment for our students, for our, our, our young Fijians to be able to have that mindset? I remember as a kid that, you know, I remember some of the guys did not do well in school, and the teacher used to say, what, you want to become a farmer? Because farming was looked down upon. Some people are now in the farming profession making lots of money. I remember one farmer in, um, a couple of years ago, I went with the Honorable Prime Minister to Vanua Levu, and his Yangona harvest, harvest gave him $1.2 million. Price was good then. So, our attitude in terms of farming, those types of professions, what is the educational system doing in terms of numeracy, literacy? Are you able to identify people who are, you know, are competent in those areas? How are you encouraging people to, for example, somebody may be really good with their hands in doing carpentry? What path do we create for them? To recognize people who may have a lot of empathy in them, and we use that empathy to create career paths for them. Those are the questions that we need to ask. And there for us are challenges. If all the chefs go off to Australia from Fiji, who's going to cook our food in the hotels? We want tourists to come. We might have to start getting overseas labor, overseas chefs. We already have Bangladeshi workers and Filipino workers on construction sites. When Christchurch had an earthquake a few years ago, a lot of our people were given short-term permits to go and go these bricklayers, carpenters, joiners. Now they've been given permanent residency with a general shortage of those people. People who want to work in a refrigeration area, electricians. So we have to understand what are the needs of our society. This is why when we give the toppers, a lot of the toppers are not for accounting, but in the science-based areas. We don't have enough land surveys. The problem with land surveys, we don't have enough, for example, marine scientists, foresters. Are we recognizing those skill sets in your students so we can encourage them to enter into those areas? Are we changing mindsets of parents? A lot of parents say, I want my son to be a daughter, to be a doctor, a lawyer. Too many lawyers, we don't give toppers for lawyers. So those are some of the things that we need to focus on. Of course, things like productivity is critically important. Minimum wage, of course, as you know, is going up to $4 an hour by January next year. There have been uh, quarterly increments on that. We will continue to invest in education, health services, uh, infrastructure development, of course, connectivity, as I mentioned to you earlier on. Uh, health services, as you know, now we've changed the dynamics. Please go to the government Facebook page you'll see that now you can go to a private doctor and we pay for all the services, the selected ones. You have to put in a bid, nebulizer, ECG, urine test, blood test, full blood count, liver test, kidney test, all of that is paid for by government. We don't want everybody to go up to the you know, public health system and queue up. It puts pressure. If you went, if you had a headache and had flu and you went to the public hospital, in Brisbane, they'll send you away. They'll say, go and see your private doctor. They won't see you in the public health system. In Australia, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, the waiting time at a public hospital was 24 hours. Why? We have shortage of nurses. Guess where they're going to come to? They might come running to us, take our nurses. So when we plan the budget, we need to give more scholarship, more training for our nurses. We have to look at, for example, as announced in the revised budget, look at what we call retention of civil servants and scarcity, recognition of scarce skill sets. For us, those are the thorough, you know, moving forward, those are the challenges we have. Okay, so education, this is how much money we spend. The Ministry of Education gets $447.1 million in the revised budget. That includes your salaries and everything else. Higher education institutions, we give $47.9 million. That includes all the you know, tertiary institutions that we fund. Tertiary education loan scheme, $111.3 million. 
Toppers, $45.2 million. Ongoing rehabilitation construction of school, about $10 million. So about $700 million in the education sector. School student teacher information. This is, uh, so you know, number of primary schools, I'm sure you, all of you know this. The teachers there, the principals, the head teachers, I thought we'd present that to you. So overall, you're the largest ministry in terms of civil number of civil servants that are hired. We need to, I mean, to be frank about it, the HR department, the Ministry of Education over the number of years has not been good. It needs to improve significantly to be more responsive. The way we see through Ministry of Civil Service is that you are the customers or the clients of your HR department. They need to serve you well. So then you can serve your clients, which are the students. As you know, many years ago, people used to come and line up outside Marella House, 18 hours, 24 hours to get a place that no longer happens. There are some changes that have taken place, obviously, and we want to continuously change that. Just in terms of the toppers and tells, uh, $156.5 million, you know, in the, in the uh, tells and toppers uh, scheme. Um, we had reduced, increased the marks, we've now reduced it to 250 in terms of entry level. We are currently looking at what we can do more with TVET um, and also in respect of the you know, vocational uh, sort of side of things, what, what we can fund. There's, uh, in the budget consultation we had at FNU, at the Sound Buller campus, the issues raised about some people are doing courses, so for example, they're doing mechanical, you know, um, course, they have to go out and work as apprentices and then come back, whether we can provide more for them in terms of retention, in terms of the salaries. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's sort of uh, essentially what I want to present to you. Uh, please go to this website because it gives you a lot of information. Uh, as you know that under the law, we also required to publish the state of the economy uh, before the election that's already published. You can go and have a look at that uh, and you'll find a lot of information. As I, as I highlighted to you earlier on that what is happening globally, in particular in terms of the job market, we need to be responsive to the educational system. Uh, we need to be able to ensure that the mindsets that we create in terms of long-term aspects, that we need to be able to ensure that they'll be able to be responsive to the job market. Very important. I think the, the other point that I, last point I'd like to make is that we have to think about the future. When you have 65% of the population below the age of 35, you're going to, biologically speaking, you have more babies. Young people make babies, not old people. In Japan, you go to a supermarket, there's a 75-year-old that's packing your groceries. Over 50% of the population, I think, is over the age of 60 or 65 in Japan, if not more. So how they do their budgets, how they plan for the future is very different. How we plan for our budget, how we plan for our future is very different. You need more pediatric training, more pediatrics. You need more, uh, for example, uh, midwives. Encourage more people to do midwifery. You need all of that because you have to cater for the population that's coming. So those are the kind of, sort of strategic decisions we have to understand we have to be able to realize. Because the students that you're teaching now will very soon be working, will become parents. So, what, how are we catering for them? So, ladies and gentlemen, those are some of the questions that I want to, you know, just highlight to you. Uh, I'd now I'd like to open up the floor for any questions or comments that you may have. Uh, please feel free to ask anything or make any comment on anything. As you know that the budget will be uh, delivered Budget will be delivered next Friday uh, on the 15th of July, around about 7.30, p.m. And then by law, we have to have one week's break, and then the following week, the budget gets debated, and then, God willing, the budget gets passed at the end of the week. So let's open up the floor if you have any questions or comments, or any suggestions, indeed, that we could take on board. Thank you.